you're the only answer to the darkness. You're the only right among the wrong. You're the only hope among the chaos. You are the voice that calls me on louder than Church. We're going to turn it over to a video. Check this out. Good morning. Welcome to Family Bible Church Online. We are the Sandy family. I'm Doug. And I'm Chris. Hi, guys. I'm David. I'm Caleb. I'm Sarah. I'm Levi. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm Leah. And I'm Noah. Even though we can't be with you in person, we are so excited and encouraged that we get to worship together online. We'd like to encourage you with a verse from God's Word. This is Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow, it was fun to see the Sandy family. Um, and so we're excited uh, to have people every week uh, from here on out. We're going to try and have a different family from Family Bible Church 
uh, say hi to everyone, to kind of keep you connected. So if you would like to do one of those video clips for us, all you need to do is make sure that it's, uh, you know, kind of this direction and uh, send it in to us. If you'd like more information on that, please uh, email me or text me and I'll get you where to send that. Well, God bless you. We're glad that you're joining online. Uh, in just a minute, Andrew's going to come and do the children's message. But I just want you to know, it's a great day to give our life to the Lord. To give your life to the Lord. Today, the message from Psalm 25 is just really all about that. What it means to give ourselves to God. And even if you've given yourself to the Lord a long, long, long time ago, Every day we need to make it new because God's mercies are new every day and we need to keep coming to him and seeking him to make sure our relationship's right. Now, I hope that God blesses you as you continue to worship. Remember the things that we have online? You can see that through Zoom, the Bible study that uh, David Mayer is, uh, Pastor Dave is uh, sharing on Thursday nights, some of the things for Crossways and for Remain and other life groups. Catch all that information online. Pastor Andrew, come and do a children's message for us adults and kids. Amen. Good morning, Family Bible Church. It's good to see you this morning. I'm going to ask the kids to come closer to the screen so they can see me really big. I'm excited. So today, like Pastor Tim said, is the message is, I give my life to you. We need to give our lives to God. And in Psalm chapter 25, verse 1, it says this, O oh Lord... I give my life to you. Now, why do we need to do that? Maybe we don't always do the right thing. You know, one of the most amazing things about being in children's ministry for the past 16 years is I get to play with you guys before we start our Bible lessons. And usually, for the most part, we all play in harmony and everyone gets along and you know it depends on how many kids sometimes we have eight kids sometimes we have 16 or 20 kids in the nursery or first through third grade but every once in a while not very often but every once in a while we start to hear these words like my my toy my doll or those are my toys my trucks my blocks and when we start to act like that, we start to put ourselves over everyone else. And that's not what God wants us to be like. And it kind of lands us in this place I like to call the pig pen. I'm going to put it up here. It's kind of fuzzy and dirty because that's what pig pens are like. Do we want to stay in the pig pen, in the mess, in the yuck? I don't think so. It's not a good place to be. Where would we like to be? How about this? The meadow. Yes, wouldn't you like to be in the meadow instead of the pig pen? The beautiful flowers, the butterflies, the birds, the trees, everything around us looks amazing. But how do we get out of the pig pen? It's separate from the meadow. Because otherwise the pigs would be all over this place. And would it look like that anymore? No, probably not. We have to go through this amazing thing. It's called the gate. There it is. And the gate reminds me of Jesus. When we're doing things that we're not supposed to be doing, to get out of the pig pen that we get ourselves stuck in sometimes, we have to go through the gate to get out. And the gate is Jesus. And Jesus is the only way out of the pig pen. Jesus <clears throat> wants us to know that we don't need to stay in the pig pen. He can help us get out of the pig pen if we give our lives to him and when we make that decision we can live in the meadow or heaven forever and ever and ever but that decision just doesn't stop there and it's like oh i don't have to do anything else because once i do then i need to make sure i'm always praying i need to make sure i'm reading my bible i need to make sure that i get involved in ministry in some way or serve the Lord in some way. And I need to tell others about it. Because how many of us probably know somebody who's stuck in the pig pen right now? Just like we don't want to be there. We don't want our friends or our family or our relatives to be there. But sometimes people don't know how to get out. So we need to tell them about Jesus. 
And that's what this message is about this morning. It's about understanding that Jesus can help me get out of the place that I'm stuck in, like the pig pen. Now, I'm going to pray. So sometimes we don't understand how to do it. If you want to get out of the pig pen this morning, I want you to pray this prayer with me this morning. I'm going to help you get right with God this morning. If you haven't made that decision in your life, today is a good day, like Pastor Tim said. It's a great day to make a choice to get out of the pig pen, go through the gate, and get into the meadow. So you're going to pray with me this morning. Dear Jesus, I want to have a relationship with you. I know I can't save myself because I am a sinner. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe that you died for me. And I receive your gift of salvation. I surrender my life to you. Trust you for your forgiveness. Help me to follow you all of my life. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. God bless you guys. I hope you made that choice today. And if you haven't, that's how to do it. God bless you, Family Bible Church. We'll see you soon.
forward to when we can meet again together as a body of believers. Please bless this church. Continue to grow us in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. That's got to be one of my favorite songs. Only you, only you are worthy of the praises, Lord. I love that because he is only worthy. We are not worthy. As a matter of fact, the message today um, from Psalm 25 exemplifies that truth so clearly, that we need God, that we are not worthy in our own self, in our own strength. And today, as I share the life of David, today I want to share a little bit of tragedy in the life of David, and I want to share a little bit about the hope that he had you see, we've known him from the time he was a shepherd boy all the way to uh, the time he killed the, the great uh, giant and the time that he became king, anointed to be king above his brothers, and, and the time that, that he, he reigned in Hebron and for seven years and then in Jerusalem. And, and there's so much about the life of David that we see in the Psalms. But I love it that he starts this psalm, Psalm 25, with these words, I give my life to you. Here it is. Oh Lord, I give my life to you. This is the clearest and simplest message of the Bible. If we could make it this clear, it's a prayer where we humble humans just cry out to a God who is invisible, but the one true God. There is only one God, the Bible tells us. There is only one God the Bible tells us who that God is, and there's only one mediator between God and us humans, and that is Jesus Christ, God's Son, who is Himself, God who always has been, always existed, who helped create all things. And this is what we do, is we just simply say, O oh God, O oh Lord, we just, we just pray, and we just say these words, I give 
my life to you. You know, as we give our lives to the Lord, and I love it that it uses this word, oh Lord, I give my life, we understand that he is the one who has the rights to be Lord. He has the rights to be master and king, the boss of our lives. And when we've made a mess of it, when we've been in the pig pen, when we've been lost and mucked and mired with the, the, the decay of sin, and we come to the Lord humbly and say, oh God, I give my life to you. He's gracious. He's willing to take our lives and, and, and accept what we are, what we were, and turn us into what he alone can make of us. How he can bring us into the, the meadow. I like the illustration, Andrew. Never heard it said quite like that. Where we go through the gate, one and only Jesus Christ. So what an amazing uh, psalm. There's 22 verses here. The Hebrew uh, language in which it was, uh, which was written by David had 22 uh, letters in the alphabet. And this was one of those acrostic psalms where, where the first uh, verse would start with a, an Aleph or like an A and then B, C, D all the way down. And, but these 22 verses uh, really share for us uh, a, the heartbeat of David. Now again, this, we can see as we're reading through this psalm that this wasn't when he was a little kid. This wasn't when he was a shepherd boy. This wasn't when he was young. This is after he's been seasoned in life, after he's become mature, probably about my age, I would say, you know, maybe early 60s. And here, you know, because the, the Bible tells us that David reigns, you know, for 40 years and from the time he's 30 to the time he's 70 when he dies. And it's about this time in life where he's seasoned and yet he's reflective. He's looking back over life. And even at this age in his life, he's still saying this prayer. This isn't just a one time when you're young where you say, I give my life to you, Jesus, and then it's it. All throughout life, we need to continually be refreshed. If you've been here on the worship team this morning or already standing behind the pulpit, you need, we need, I need, those people in the back that are recording us, they need that. And all the people that are watching this, every single person in the world needs this message because every single one of us need to reaffirm that our life which is so short, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last, that we would give our life to the Lord. So it's fitting that this is the first verse. I think it's what the psalm is all about. I've got seven points, and I'm excited about each one. Here's the first one. I'll trust you because you're able. I'll trust that you are able. I love this. If I give my life to God, I have to realize that he's able to take it, that he's able to take control, that he's able to be Lord. He's able to be the boss. He, he really is smarter than me. He really knows how to fix the mess I've made. I know that he is able. Look at what David writes in verse 1 uh, through 3. Oh, Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. I trust. In you, you, you have to trust. You know, and, and in our world today, everything is uncertain. We're planning things that are uncertain. You know, I mean, the ladies' retreat is one of those things that's uncertain. The men's retreat this last year was uncertain. We had it all planned. We had all of the speakers lined up, and we didn't do the retreat. We had Vacation Bible School, the theme, from, from over a year ago, and, and we didn't do it. So life is uncertain. You may have had plans. You had vacations, as, as we did, and they're uncertain. But the thing that is certain is the one who holds it all. Nothing escapes him, and nothing takes him off guard. And The Lord is so confident of his plan, because his plan always comes to fruition. We don't always know what his plan is. We, we sometimes wonder, well, what is happening next? Why is this happening? Oh, God, do you know that everything is happening? And God's saying, yes, I know. So David writes, oh, Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced. Now, why in the world could David write words like that, do not let me be disgraced? 
And he's going to tell us in here what causes disgrace. Obviously, if we make the wrong decisions, go down a wrong path, a little bunny trail here, a little side way that the Lord hadn't really planned as best for us. We're not doing the, the thing that God says is His perfect will. We're, we're doing something else. He says, do not let me be disgraced. Or, or, or God, even better, do not let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. Now, how many people in the world here have ever been defeated? Anybody in the room that's here still? Yes, see, the worship team, the other pastors. We've all had experiences of defeat. We've all gone through times where things didn't go the way we had planned. And sometimes it's because we've done stuff wrong or we've thought about things wrong. Maybe because we've taken in the information that we've got and, and we got it from a bad source. Have you ever realized that you might read something and it's the wrong source? People get really excited about something and they want you to read it and catch it because to them at that time it's true and it's not. It depends on who you hear it from. You, you, you never know. As a matter of fact, even some of the most reliable people sometimes get it wrong. And he says, I trust in you, God. You don't get it wrong. Do not let me be disgraced. Do not let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced. But disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Has David ever tried to deceive anybody? I mean, we got this guy. He's, he's our hero. I mean, he's written so many of these psalms. This guy was, and in God's perspective, God looks at us and says, David is a man after my own heart. He almost always did what pleased me, except in that little case where and he reminds us of Uriah the Hittite, okay? If you don't know the story, then get back to the, the Old Testament and read it. You'll find out. Uriah had been married to a lady named Bathsheba. Maybe you remember that part of the story. Of course, we know David did other things wrong. Remember the time of the census and how God sent the plague and how God had to stop it, you know, at, at the, the outside the city of Jerusalem there on, you know, the threshing floor of Arun of the Jebusite. Okay, God, David's done some things. But nothing quite as severe as plotting the death of the husband of the lady he's been lustful with. No one who trusts in you, God, will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. There was at least a year in his life where there was bad stuff happening. Have we ever done something wrong? Yes. But I love that this guy in the New Testament who, who wrote most of the New Testament, the, the Apostle Paul, who writes for us this, uh, this word, so this last letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he says this, Timothy, I know whom I've trusted in. He says, I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard whatever I've entrusted to him until the day of his return. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is able to take care of you in the midst of uncertainty of COVID-19? Do you know that God could take care of you in the uncertainty of the economy and the uncertainty of the election, the uncertainty of the world and its pandemic? There is a greater pandemic than the thing that's going around, and it's the pandemic of sin that has corrupted us and kept us in the pig pen. And every single one of us need to turn to the only solution. There is only one God and one Savior and the one God and the one Savior is the God that we're preaching from the Bible. The only Savior is Jesus the Christ. And America needs to turn to one religion, one God, one Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the only one who sacrificed his life willingly on a cross, who was buried and came to life again on the third day. And this Jesus Christ is the only hope 
for America and the only hope for the world and the only Savior that will change our lives. And He is able to take care of anything I dare am willing to trust Him for. I give my life to you. I trust you are able. At the end of the children's message, the prayer was there. I give my life to you. At the end of each point, it could be just like that. I give my life to you. You could have given your life to the Lord, boom, right at the end of the children's message. You could do it right now after point one. I trust you, God, you're able. I give my life to you. And after every point, you have a chance to give your life to Christ, to re-surrender your life to Christ. I hope that this burns in you like it's burning in me, point two. God, show me the right path. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. Do you know that there's points in your life where you get really intense and you, you come before the Lord and you say, Lord, help me, save me. It's not just save my soul the moment I confess my sins, but throughout life we, we get to the place where we say, God, save me. Save me in this one. Save me in this car accident. Save me in this tough situation that I'm in between this and that. Lord, Lord, save me over here. But David is saying, Lead me by your truth. Teach me. You are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. And you, and you just take this. You just take this one verse and you say, Oh, wow, David's got it all together. He always trusts the Lord. He's never failed. He's just doing it right. And he just says, God, all day long, I trust you. This is a positive affirmation that we need to say when things are not going right, when we haven't already done it right. How many of you are parents? Or how many of you want to be parents, okay? Now wait until your kids grow up a bit. And as your kids grow up a bit, you say, oh, wow, you know, if, if you get them to the age of 18, you, you feel like as parents, say, if I could only get my kids to the age of 18, oh, I'm done. My wife's over there shaking her head, no, I know, Andrew, you have a kid 18? Yeah, yeah, you're shaking your head, no, you have two of them 18 now. I remember when your kids weren't even born yet, okay, it's like, but, but listen, David is, is kind of like that. You think you got, how many have a big family? Okay, you know, you saw the Sandy family there, and I've just been praying for them diligently so I could remember all the kids' names in order. You know, I had to do the same with the Knopp family for, you know, a long, long time. And, and, and d different families. I had to pr pray a long time for the Gear family. The Gear family. Someday you'll see them up there. It's not because they have a lot of kids, but because their names are all different than what I'm normally used to. It's not like Tom, Dick, Jane, and Harry. It's kind of like four girls that are all start with a letter F, you know. So, but hey, listen. God knows everything about us. And he knows we're going through difficulties. And King David went through difficulties. First of all, he had more than one wife. And right now, we realize in this point in time in David's life, he already has 19 sons. And he knows their names. And he's keeping them all in order. Which ones went with which wife and... and and he's got at least one daughter that we know the name of, but he has 19 sons and a, and a daughter, and the kids have grown up. And of course, by this time, as David is in his life, David's, David has already blown it. He's already sinned with Bathsheba and killed Uriah. The, the, the moral decay that, that came from that result was evident in the life of his kids. And his firstborn son, Amnon, grew up, and because of his cousins, he listened to some bad advice and decided to be immoral with his sister, his half-sister, Tamar. And how do you think David's feeling? David realized something that, you know, the kids have grown up either good or bad based upon how, 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 how well their, their mom did, 
more than how well he did because he was like an absentee father. He had dropped his responsibilities off at the door. And now David is looking back over at life and he says, Oh God, please lead me. Please teach me your truth. You are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. Sometimes we're looking back at the situation and saying, God, I'm going to put my hope in you on this one. I don't see how this is going to turn out. I don't know how this is going to turn out with my kids. One of his kids later on, the one that was born from he and Bathsheba, named Solomon, who pens this passage in Proverbs 3, says these words, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Some of the favorite verses in Scripture. Trust in the Lord. I give my life to you, Lord. I'll follow your lead. Are you going to follow the Lord's lead? Are you going to say, Lord, I'm not going to trust in my own ability, my own wisdom, my own strength? Or are you going to be able to honestly say, like David is saying here, Lord, man, I really, I know I've been the shepherd and you've been my shepherd, but I've been in the pig pen. And I really need to come back to you. And I really need to trust you. Some of the things that happened in my family are all messed up because of what I did earlier. But in the New Testament, Jesus says these words in John chapter 14, the Holy Spirit, yes, He, the Holy Spirit, is the one who will lead you into all truth. Remember, David was filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and several of the Old Testament people were, and all the Christians of the New Testament have the Holy Spirit of God in them, and the Holy Spirit of God is prompting them and telling them. And even when you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, sometimes you choose to do the wrong thing, and you need to come back and you say, Lord, I give my life to you. I'll follow your lead. What, what does that mean? That means when I say, I'll follow your lead, God, I'll follow your lead, it means, you know what? I haven't been following your lead you're a God of faith and I've been doubting. You're a God of confidence and I've been worrying. You're a God of love and I've been hating. You're a God of forgiveness and I've been holding bitterness. You're a God of who's able. And right now, God, I give my life to you. I'll follow your lead. And at the end of this point, you could say, oh God, I give my life to you. I want to follow you. Lead me. I stopped trusting in my own way to figure it out. I'll stop doing it my way. The next verse goes on like this. And the point is, I'll ask for your mercy every day. Why, why, why does David need to ask for mercy every day? I mean, you think, man, he's got this. He's a, he's a man of God. He's got it. Why does he need to ask for mercy every day? Why do I need to ask for mercy every day? Well, if you knew, knew me, if my, as my wife does, and some of the rest of you, you, you know why I have to ask for mercy every day. It's like, because we're flawed. And every day we say something, or do something, or think something that is devious, or nasty, or deceitful, or wretched, or unkind. Why do we do that? So that God realizes he can just keep putting us in the place where we need to be. The humble place of his blessing. The humble place where we say, oh God, it's a new day. I need your mercies. But this is what David writes. Remember, oh Lord, remember your compassion. What, what does that mean? That God's a compassionate God. That God cares about you. That God thinks about you. God knows about you. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've thought. He knows what you've done. He knows all about us. Remember, O oh Lord, David says, your compassion, and remember your unfailing love. You know, sometimes it's good for us to remind God of how good he is. God, God remember, you know, it's like little kids coming, Mommy, Mommy, you're really patient. You're really, Daddy, you're really merciful. Remember, I remember when I taught my kids mercy, and, and then after that, they was like, Daddy, remember mercy. I like that, mercy. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion, your unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. And then David writes these words. This is the third point. 
Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Now, what is he talking about? I mean, again, I mean, rebellious, was he a rebellious teenager? You know, was he rebellious out there with the sheep? Was he rebellious when he went to, the, to see his older brothers in the war? What is, what is youth? I think youth is everything behind us, okay? How many would vote for that? Anything we'd done before, but now we're, we're much more mature. We're much gro more grown up. Man, it's like, remember, don't, for, don't remember the sins of my youth, those former, th the ones that are behind me, Lord. Man, I'm, man, I, sorry about that. I'm slapping my face. That's real. I know how to wake you up now, people. Okay, okay, sorry, Michael. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion, your unfailing love, which you've shown from long ages. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O oh Lord. And here he is now trying to figure out how to deal with these rebellious kids that he's grazed. Have you ever seen your two-year-old do something? You go, where did they learn that? And you look at your spouse did they learn it from you or me? I want to just tell you that, that, that sin is passed on from generation to generation. I believe the scriptures clearly teaches that this comes from the dad. The sinful nature is passed on from the dad. But all kinds of wickedness is learned from moms too. So, But you know what? Good things are learned from dads and moms too. And I praise the Lord for the ability to teach humility and grace. But I'm going to tell you right now that David didn't discipline his son, even though he heard that the son, his oldest firstborn son, Amnon, had raped his daughter, Tamar. He was grieved. He was hurt. Maybe he's writing psalms at this time. But the Bible says he didn't do anything about it. And two years later, Tamar's brother, full-blooded brother, it's David's third son named Absalom, takes matters into his own hands and gets revenge on his older half-brother and conspires to kill him. Now, when I look at the Scripture, I see real mess. I see problems. I see difficulties. It almost seems like the way of the world around here, right here in the Scriptures. People are, are messed up. They're, they're mixed up, and they do wrong things, just like the first sin, you know, of, of, of the kids in the Bible. Not, not Adam and Eve, but the, the kids, Cain and Abel, and, and how they, Cain killed his brother, and... and Absalom conspires to kill his brother, and now David is heartbroken and grieving. He's got a son who finally took revenge, even though David didn't do anything, and, and now he's feeling heartbroken and upset and grieving and mad and hurt and feeling guilty. This is it. Why is he feeling guilty? Because he's done something wrong. Remember, O oh Lord, your love, your unfailing love. Don't remember the guilt of my youth, the rebellious ways. Lamentations is uh, written by Jeremiah, and Jeremiah says these words later on. He says, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Parents, grandparents, people of Family Bible Church, people who are listening online, I want you to know if you feel like you failed, if you feel like you got some kids and you thought you raised them in the right way and they've gone astray, if you've got some things in your own life that you see years later and you go, man, that was something that, that was sparked by the, the, the sin of my past, and I want you to come humbly before the Lord and say, Lord, I give my life to you. I ask for your mercy every day.
You know, we all need to do that. This wasn't just a thing that David had to do because he was king. It wasn't just because he had his... We all have situations where we all need to say, Oh God, end of point three, I give my life to you. Are you willing to do that? Then you've caught part of the message of this psalm. God, your mercy's new. Great is your faithfulness. Your mercy's new. Please forgive me. Oh, he wished that and prayed that for all of his kids. For some it was too late, but for others it was not. I give my life to you. He goes on in the next verse, verses 8 to 10. The Lord is good. It's almost like David wants to turn around and just kind of give testimony. Do you know the Lord's good, people? Andrew, the Lord's good. You know, Barry, the Lord's good. Daniel, you know that? Christy, you know it? The Lord is good. The Lord is good and he does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. Guys, if you've gone astray, here's the right path. Remember the shepherd psalm a few weeks ago and the shepherd's staff or the crook, you know, the, 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 he, he goes to his sheep and he says, hey, you've gone down the wrong path. Come back. You know, my job as a pastor is to preach the word and to teach the word. And my job sometimes asks for, for me to ask you, are you doing the right thing? Are you living the right place? Are you in the right path? And if you're not... My job isn't to condemn you. My, my job is to say, are you in the right path? And when you're honest enough to say, no, I'm not, then it's my privilege to be able to say, here's the right path. Let's walk in it. And that's the job of every single believer, every single follower of Jesus Christ. It's our job to look out for each other, to care for each other and say, this is the right path. Come with me. Let's walk it together. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the, what is the word? Humble. He leads the humble in doing right. You know, I go to somebody and say, hey, are you doing the right thing? And they go, hey, leave me alone. I can do whatever I want to do. Whoop, not humble. Sorry. You go to somebody and say, here, are you following Jesus? Hey, it's none of your business. Okay. You go to somebody and say, hey, you following Jesus? Well, you know, I'm not really. Would you like to? No. Okay. If you go to somebody and say, hey, you know, are you on the right path? And they go, no, I'm not. I really don't know which way the path is. Then you say, let me show you the right path. Come with me. Come to Family Bible Church. Tune in here. Listen to this. Get involved in this Bible study. Come hear this. Look at the Word. Let me show you the Word. Here it is. He leads the humble in doing right. He teaches them His way. The Lord leads with unfailing love, unfailing faithfulness, all who keep His covenant and obey His demands. You see, I'm going to tell you this right now, that God has demands. God has demands on our life. And a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, God doesn't have any demands. He doesn't have any commands. He's, you know, he's, and somehow people think that, you know, God is better than any government or any president or any king because, you know, God just kind of lets you do whatever you want. No! God has demands. Holiness, perfection, obedience, respect. Do not take my name in vain, or I will hold you guilty. Whoa. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Oh, but I thought we should be open to all kinds of religions. God is so specific. He calls people to one way, to one name, to one salvation, one God. And somebody said, well, well wait a minute. That, that sounds like God's pretty demanding. Yes. You got the message. God is a demanding God. And there's no way in the world that any one of us could ever measure up to his demands. There is no way any one of us could ever get into heaven. There is no way any one of us could buy our way, get our way, attain salvation without humility coming before him and say, God, I can't do it. I need you. And I just give my life to you. But the picture of the pig pen needs to come to, mark, to mind where we say, God, I've messed up my life and it stinks before you. And God says, oh, now you've caught it. All we like sheep have gone astray. <laughs> yes, all of you have gone to the muck and the mire. 
And he says, the Lord is good and does what is right. And he shows this and to those who obey his demands. <laughs> Look at Deuteronomy. Moses writes for us in Deuteronomy when he's telling the Israelite people why God took them through the wilderness for 40 years. He says, remember how the Lord your God led you through the, the wilderness for these past 40 years. He was humbling you. He was testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Would you obey his commands? you obey his demands? If not, here's the time where we, at the end of this point, we say, oh God, I pray. I give my life to you. I'll humbly obey your commands. I surrender to you. And then he goes on. Verses 11 to 13, he says in the middle of the psalm, I, I'll confess my sin. I'm going to turn from it. I'll confess my sin. You know, I think sometimes you have to kind of go through the list. It's like, I did this and this and this and this and this. I just confess it. He says, for the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. I really love the NLT in this chapter of the scriptures. It's really clear. And David is saying, Lord, forgive my many, many sins. And we're saying, wow, David was a good guy. Yeah, he was. He was the best of all the kings. He was a righteous man. Everybody else either did what David did or didn't do what David did. And it's kind of like Jesus comes from the line of David. And David said, oh, God, forgive my many, many sins. I think Christians need this passage of Scripture Psalm 25. I don't know if you've ever gotten excited about Psalm 25, but I've never preached or gotten excited about a psalm I don't think is this one because, because I think that David just kind of spells out. Even though he made some mistakes along the way that, were, that, that are showing up now in genera the next generation, even though he's, he's failed and, and he can see his own flaws, he's coming back and says, God, He's teaching us how to confess our sins. It's almost like 1 John 1, 9, which I didn't have room in my notes to put in there. But 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Listen to this. Who are those who fear the Lord? Forgive my many, many sins. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. If you're afraid, you're, you, you come before the Lord, oh Lord, do you know my sin? And God says, yep. And you say, well, I thought I could deceive you, God. I, I just thought maybe I could hide this one. You wouldn't really know about this one. David said, I tried that for about a year. It was the dumbest thing I've ever done. You can't hide from God. We can't hide from God. And so at the end of this point, we, we need to confess our sins and turn from it. He says, you will show them the path that they should choose. They will live in what? Prosperity. And their children will inherit the land. Now, your kids will like it if you take to heart this scripture. Your children will inherit the land. They're going to be blessed. Well, they're going to be blessed by your attitude and your life, your convictions, and your desire to follow God. It says they will live in prosperity and their children will inherit the land. People, there's nothing wrong with being blessed. There's nothing wrong with being prosperous. But if you... That's the next verse. Look at this, Proverbs 28, 13. People who conceal their sins will not prosper. Now, you wait a minute. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. I know there's a lot of people in, uh, in, in Hollywood. I know there's a lot of people in, the, in Washington, D.C. I, I know there's people in every state and every government. There's people who look like they're prospering. And yet, they've concealed their sin. They're covering it up. Are they really prospering, my friends? Are they really prospering? Are people whose marriages aren't stable prospering? Are people whose children are rebellious prospering? Are people who are not right with God prospering? Are people who are, 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 are warped and, and frustrated and, and in the midst of of, of Things that, that are addictive to them, are they prospering? If they can't even sleep without getting drunk, are they prospering? It says here, 
He will show them the path they should choose and they will live in prosperity. Children inherit the land. But people who conceal their sins won't prosper. But this is the point. If we confess them. If we confess and turn to the Lord. If we confess and turn. That's really, this is the word repentance in the scriptures. We, we confess, we say, God, this is what I've done. And then turn away from them and turn to them. We will receive what? Mercy. Receive mercy. The end of this point, we just need to say, God, I'll give my life to you. I'll confess my sin. And I'll turn from it. That's repentance. And then he says this, the Lord is a friend to those who fear him. The Lord is a friend. I love it that that David knows that God wants to be his friend. The Lord wants to be his friend. He's his shepherd. He's his guide. He's his teacher. He's holy. But now he says he's my friend. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. My eyes are always on the Lord, for he rescues me from the traps of my enemies. It doesn't mean that everything goes perfect for David. And even though he's feeling prosperous, there's other times he's feeling run out of town. That's a whole other story when his son Absalom at the end of his kingdom kind of chases David out. But, but my friends, the Lord is a friend if you fear him. What is the point? To keep your eyes on God. Keep your eyes on, fixed on Jesus. My eyes are always on the Lord. He rescues me from the traps of my enemies. Proverbs 17, 24 says, Sensible people keep their eyes glued on wisdom, but a fool's eyes wander to and fro throughout the earth. Wander. Oh, oh, sidetracked all the time. Hebrews 12. The writer of Hebrews, maybe Silas, I don't know who it exactly, but it says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. My friends, here's the point. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. If you failed Get your eyes realigned. If you're starting to sink in the waves, cry out to Jesus and get your eyes back on Jesus and you'll come out of the, 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 the waves that are causing you to be overcome with fear. Keep your eyes on Jesus. At the end of this point, you can just simply say, Oh God, I give my life to you. I need to keep my eyes back on Jesus. Back on Jesus fixed on Jesus. Keep my eyes on Jesus. Wow. Here we go. Last point. Turn to me and have mercy. Turn to me and have mercy, for I am alone and in deep distress. Uh, Can you imagine David saying words like this? Turn to me and have mercy, for I am alone and in deep distress. My problems go from bad to worse. Oh, save me from all of them. Feel my pain. See my trouble. Forgive all my sins. See how many enemies I have and how viciously they hate me. Protect me. Rescue my life from them. Do not let me be disgraced. For in you I take refuge. May integrity May honesty protect me, for I put my hope in you, O God. Ransom Israel from all of its troubles. I'm going to just finish it up here in Psalm 25. He wraps it up, and David says, I'm going to put my hope in your word. I'm going to put my hope in your word. Have you done that? Today, I hope that you'll do that. You'll put your hope in God's word. Psalm 119, the longest psalm, ends the words for us when it says, May all who fear you find in me a cause for joy, for I have put my hope in your word. 
he ends this psalm with these words. I want to be an example. I want to be an example for all of you that are looking, for all of you that are watching. I want to be an example. And when you look at me, I want you to know that I have hope, that I've placed my hope firmly in your word. My friends, as we conclude the message, have you said you'll give your life to the Lord? Right now, will you say that? Will you pray? Because God's name is so powerful. God is the only one that we can trust completely in. And I have put my hope in his word. I give my life to you. Can you say that? Let's pray. Our Father God, we surrender our lives to you. I surrender my life to you. As pastor of Family Bible Church, flawed as I am, I come to you. Father, each one of us in our best are still flawed compared to your perfection. And each of us need to surrender to you, to trust you, to know that you're able, to confess to you our failures, and to, to believe that you will lead us down the right path. We trust you, Lord, to walk in the path of holiness and the path of righteousness to, to, so that we follow your lead and that we'll go that way. For you are a great God. and We just give our lives to you now. May everyone that's listening stop and say, Lord, I call you Lord. Thank you for giving your life for me. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
There is no one greater than you. And my life forever praise the glory of your name. There is no one higher than you. Wow. We believe that song. We believe that truth. I know that some of you had a little disruption right there because part of the message kind of like got interrupted for a brief second and you had to kind of like reboot, uh, like we had to reboot a computer or something in the back. And, and I know my sound guys were talking when I was preaching and, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to just repeat the points. Just, just here they are. I'll trust you are able. See, the first one, I'll give my life to you. I'll trust you are able. The second one's, I'll follow your lead. The third one, I'll ask for your mercy every day. The fourth one is, I'll humbly obey your demands. The fifth, I'll confess my sins and turn from it. The sixth was, I'll keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. And finally, I'll put my hope in your word. God bless you guys. I'm so glad you're a part of Family Bible Church Online. Uh, until we get to meet again, God bless you. Take care.